So I can smile at it. <laughs>
just you know the, the display nearest you, right? Just look at a table here, and uh, you know what we're talking about here are uh, not necessarily chips per se or designs, but you know if you start looking at the first one, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard the, uh, the name or the term Titanic, right? HMS Titanic, Her Majesty Service Titanic, um, Tacoma Narrows Bridge, Edsel Automobile. War in Vietnam, Apollo 13. I mean, they are so dissimilar. And uh, the thing that is important to note for each one of them is that there's a common thread here uh, in some of the world famous failures. And, uh, and you know, if I just complete this slide and show you uh, stuff on the right side, you can see here that certainly, you know, each one of these has a particular year when that happened, but then there's three columns uh, one is RD, which is requirements document. The second is DER, which is verification. And the third one is validation, DAL, right? Um, so, if, you know, we won't go through each one of them and bore you, but, um, but if you look at the, the Titanic, uh, it had these rivets, and they were made with certain material. And it just so happened that these rivets were not designed to the specs. So when it hit... Um, the iceberg, uh, because the rivets were not designed to the specs, you know, that led to the whole hull collapsing and then the ship pretty much the same thing, right? Um, Tacoma's Narrows Bridge. Um, here we have a bridge that worked just fine in Chicago, but when we brought that bridge and, you know, put up a bridge just like that in, in Seattle, uh, the winds were different and therefore the environment was different, the bridge collapsed. So apparently in cases like that, you know, design was perfect, but it was not perfect for the given condition, right? Um, Edsel automobile, great automobile, had a, a beautiful grill, but the, uh, the customers at that time weren't quite enthralled with that. So someone forgot to take customers' requirements into account, uh, produced an automobile that just didn't sell. So, you know, here you have a collapse of, of uh, 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 of, uh, you know, something they invested a lot of time and money and it just didn't sell. Um, another example, G refrigerator. So here we have, you know, the folks came up with a great technology saying we're going to replace the compressor. And by the way, we're going to build the compressor with uh, powdered metal. And, and so, you know, they tested the compressor for hundreds of uh, refrigerators. Everything was working fine. But after a few years, when they started selling and they produced hundreds of thousands of these, uh, what they found was that suddenly customers were just saying, my fridge is no longer working. So um, what they found out was that uh, the powdered metal was the first time they had put together, uh, you know, uh, shapes with that metal uh, for the first time. And it just so turned out that, you know, everything was fine. New compressor was good, new technology was fine, but of course the material that was used was not right. So, so you know, if you look at this paper, I, I actually read it some time back, and I found that if you go through each one of these examples, either, you know, you're failing to understand the customer, you're not capturing the requirements correctly, you're not verifying it correctly, you're not validating it correctly. At different points in time, you know, they are different points of failure. And, and that's what results in embarrassment, right? So um, uh, take a look at this chart. And here is the, you know, on the y-axis is a cost, and on the x-axis is time. And this chart, you can see the line kind of starts uh, very low cost, but then uh, with time, assuming that, you know, you worked in designing something really cool, and uh, then you would spent some time testing it, and at some point, after you felt comfortable with the test, then you started selling it in thousands or millions or billions of them, right? Um, but the idea is that as the product proliferates and goes to the customer, the cost of recall just goes higher and higher, right? Um, imagine if, uh, you know, here you started building something and you're doing verification, and you found a problem with it. then you can immediately fix the problem, and the cost is very small. Whereas if you found a problem way late, after hundreds of thousands have been deployed, you know, your cost is going to be very high. So, so 
you know how it's relevant for a course like this is when you're building something, always be looking out for problems. And if you find a problem, report a problem, fix a problem instead of waiting or maybe saying, hey, I'll deal with this later, right? I mean, because the cost is just going to go up and up as you're going, as you're progressing further and further in time. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so take a look at this table. So this table, actually it's a little old. It's, uh, we built this table at the turn of the century. So you know, 16 years have gone by, uh, the costs have only gone up. But this table is very demonstrative in that uh, when you are building a chip, we are uh, going to the stage, so uh, imagine that on the y, the y axis is kind of going down, meaning time is going uh, up and up, uh, all the way from initial design down to volume production. So when you're doing initial design, uh, 16 years ago, if you found a problem, it was about 10 bucks in chip design. You know, Starbucks and I were working on technology at that time, it would cost 10 bucks, five minutes of time to fix the problem. Um, if you found the problem a little later, where someone had done the design, but the review happened, let's say, two or three months later, right? Then the cost would be judged at about 100 bucks. And the effort to fix would be about an hour because you involve people in the design review, someone actually came, spent a few minutes with you, their time was worth money, and more work had gone in during that time, so the cost is went up, right? So you had a design that was in logic, and then you decided to lay it out in polygons. And now as you found a problem, then the, top, the cost was about a thousand dollars. And in terms of time, it was about 10 to 15 dollars because it just takes longer to fix all of those problems. And then lo and behold, if you found a problem after the whole chip had been laid out and you had sent it to the fab, um, then the cost at that time was about $10,000 to fix because you had to redo the entire thing. Um, the whole layout, I mean the fix, and regenerate the mass plate. And uh, the cost effort to fix was about two to three weeks. And I think you get the point, right? And all the way down to the very bottom row, you see volume production. Here we have hundreds of millions of chips that we are selling, and if you're doing a recall, I mean, that's a massive. So talking about recall, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard about this, Pentium, but I actually joined Intel on the day the Pentium bug was discovered. <laughs> and, you know, this was back in 1994. And literally, November 7, 1994, I joined the company. And, and here I was, wow, I'm in part of Intel now. And in the afternoon, here we were on CNN. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I saw a lot of executives looking looking so meek and humble and sorry and everything and you know here they were gods to me right so anyway it was a pretty sobering experience the first day of my of my life at Intel but uh, but you know the story goes like this uh, there was a division algorithm called SRT uh, named after the people who invented it and uh, it uses a lookup table uh, to come up with quotient and in that lookup table I actually don't know how many rows there were in the lookup table, but five entries were incorrect. So, so if you were to fix the design, let's say someone implemented a lookup table uh, using transistors and found the problem, then the design fix would be five missing transistors and a single mask. Very simple, you know, very quick. Um, if we detected it, translated that to money, that would be 100 bucks. But the problem with uh, on, well, folks just didn't know, I guess. Um, and then we manufactured these chips. We started selling millions of them. And at some point in 1994, you know, we, it was about a year or two after it went into production. Yeah, it was about a year after it went. A year, yeah. So, so within a year, I mean, the thing is that Intel manufactured these things millions. And, you know, we had plenty of customers. So um, because this particular bug escaped the attention of the designers, it went into the design, it went into the fab, and we started manufacturing and selling millions of them. And then when, you know, 
all hell broke loose. Uh, by end of November of 1994, we decided, we and the executive, the company decided we're going to recall the chips. And uh, the actual cost came out to be 450 million. Some people think it was higher, some think it was lower. But anyway, you get the point that it was very expensive to replace all of these. And of course, it's not just the cost, but also the reputation of the company. Just like when you're doing a project, imagine, you know, having a very uh, critical bug, just stay in your project and show up on the demo day, right? I mean, or assuming that you came up with a cool idea and now you started to make a prototype and you start selling it and now you have to recall it. If, if you're forming a company based on the product, that's an embarrassment and sometimes that can lead to the demise of a company, right? I mean, Intel was rich at that time, so we could afford $450 million of recall. But well, imagine a startup that's just doing you know, has 10 millions in the bank, right? So, so that was the story of this, uh, of this bug. Uh, if you go back to the previous table, for each one of them, enough postmortem has been done, and, uh, uh, you know, folks have root cause down to well where the problems were, including, you know, a few events like Challenger disaster. I mean, that was multiple congressional hearings, and Feynman came and gave his theories, and, uh, uh, you know, just a small, tiny problem with the O-rings of the, of the, um, uh, one of the parts of the shuttle. And those O-rings were probably just a few cents. And if we had uh, higher quality O-rings, then that disaster wouldn't have happened. And certainly, you know, human life would have been lost. And certainly the challenge itself was hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So, you know, the point is, Kind of sobering if you go through those examples, and one that I went through myself is this building. Okay. Um, so, uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go back and forth between a big picture and also come back to like something that you can relate to, small tiny designs, and then uh, we're trying to illustrate certain key points with those examples. So when you look at the big picture, you know you can. Translate back to your own project or product. And in Intel's case, you know, the example that I'm about to give you is the whole uh, chip, for example, for i7, right? Um, so the typical product development is done at two big phases. One is strategic planning, and the other is called product life cycle. So just think like two big chunks, right? Uh, planners, marketing folks, um, Thinking about you know well, four years from now, what kind of product would make sense? And as they get closer, they're saying, okay, this product makes sense, but have we looked at the space around it, right? So that's all exploration. And the product life cycle is where you have an idea and you start building that idea to the point where it actually becomes a product and you start selling. Okay. So now if you look at each one of these on its own, strategic planning. Um, has certainly a strategic component, you know? So every company that's building a product is thinking strategically five, 10, 15 years from now. In this case, you know, you establish a window, maybe two or three years uh, in Intel's case, and you're looking ahead. And then the second component you see is called business planning. So once you have thought about the strategy, then you're thinking, well, business-wise, how much might it cost? What is the business opportunity and, you know, your professor here is like is an expert because he led the strategic and business development of the servers. I mean, before he came here, so there's a lot of energy spent of certain, you know, type of people with experience and talent, uh, thinking about uh, what sort of business we should be investing. Uh, for engineers, you know, um, architects, um, they spend most of their time on the second half which is the product life cycle. And that looks something like this. The product life cycle has four distinct phases. One is called exploration. I mean, you know, it's like a fun. When you think of a product, and especially big companies, when they're thinking of their product, they're not honing down immediately on the product. They're looking at it as a fun. So, well, should the product have features X, Y, Z? Should it address, um, you know, this market or that market, should it be 
you know, if it's mobile, she didn't have a bag in life of this, she didn't have this sort of user experience. So it's a big funnel. And during exploration, you're trying to narrow that funnel, right? You're just coming down and trying to narrow that space of what the product should be. And that narrow field then translates to the second phase, which is called planning, right? And then from planning, at that point, now you know, after the planning phase is over, then you know exactly what you're going to work on. And that leads to the third phase called development. So during development, you're incrementally building the abstraction of the design to the point where you have a prototype and that prototype goes through testing phase and then you're ready to ship. So the fourth one is called production. And so once you're a prototype and you feel confident in the quality, then you're saying, hey, ship it. And then you start the production. So that's called product launch. And then you go into production, you do manufacturing you know, depending on the quantity of commerce, hundreds of thousands of billions or, or more, right? So that's what a life cycle looks like. Uh, keep in mind, strategic planning and a product life cycle. And the, the crux of all the activities where you are incrementally improving the quality of the design, that's all part of the second phase, which is called product life cycle. Right? So there's a couple of things to note here. And if you look at the bill, which is the, particularly the phase where a big chunk of people are actually working on it, it's called the development phase. And in the development phase, we got uh, two major phases. One is called a design phase, and then the second is called the debug phase. So any of you who have built, uh, you know, taken a project from something on paper to something where it's a prototype, you have gone through that phase yourself. You have started with something on a piece of paper, then translated that into something that looks like a schematic, then you know, done some design, and then bought some pieces of hardware, built a prototype, and then after the prototype was ready, then before showing it off to everybody, you just took it to some rigorous testing, right? So that's typically what happens. So there's a design phase and a debug phase. And most companies, and in this case I'm talking about a company like Intel. They allocate certain milestones with these um, within the development phase. So after you complete the design and you send it to the fab saying, hey guys, manufacture it so I can get the chip back and start testing it. That's called first silicon, when the first silicon arrives. And then there's this term we use production qualification, PRQ, which says, uh, at this point, I believe I've tested this particular design enough that you can start the production. And finally, there's a term called launch, where it says that not only is the hardware ready, but all bells and whistles are out there, software, marketing, everything is ready so you can launch the product in the market, right? So these are the three things. Now, most of what I talked about really doesn't apply to this class and, this, and what you're doing in the project, right? So if you were to ask yourself, what to extract from something like that is A, that there is something to be learned from a picture like that, um, even on a micro scale, because all of us are involved in taking an idea to creation, right? So that's the first part. And the second part is that there is already a semblance of milestones that you're calling out, and those milestones actually mean something with respect to the quality of the product, right? Yes. If I may, uh, first silicon might correspond to your prototype of the subsystems, the unit 403. And uh, the production quality release, that would be the middle of 404, your subsystems have been perfected. And then finally, demo day would be launched, and their system is integrated in the whole system, not just the subsystems, are ready to roll. So sitting right in front of you, you have 403, middle of 404, the end of 404. So it does apply, just different terminology. That, that's, a, that's excellent analogy, yes. And I, I mean, I'm glad that it actually relates to the milestones that are already called out in the code. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the, the, it's the same slide from the previous one, but with a little different emphasis this time. And what I'm trying to say here is that when it comes to validation or confirmation of the quality, it does not start near the end. It starts from day one. That's the other important thing to keep in mind. So, <laughs> so when we when we look at it, you know, look at this first bill, which says even in 
even as the marketing folks, the planning folks are talking about, well, how does the market look? How does, how much revenue can we make? What is the competition doing? All of these thoughts that result in certain documents and Excel sheets and projections and models, all of these go to some level of validation. Granted, in many ways, it's probably mostly documentation based or in some cases, it's a review based, right? You think of all a group of people and you do a little bit of uh, powwow, right? And you're saying, hey, I think we're going this way. What do you guys think? And then they ask you questions, so you go through a review. So that's somewhat like a validation of, of the idea. And, and, you know, I guess I can speak for all three of us here in saying that we have countless examples for where ideas were shot down uh, after the review, right? After the review. And, and the good part is to think in terms of if the reviews were not held. Someone would say, I've got this best idea since the slice of bread. I'm going to just go manufacture and commit hundreds of millions of dollars. And imagine if in the earlier stages, no reviews were held. You would involve more and more and more people, which means more and more costs, right? And all of that going down the drain. And, and many companies go out of business primarily because they did not do the right reviews at the right time, right? So that's important. The second thing you see here is uh, um, during planning stage. So as you're planning a product, right? And you're going through this class, you're planning something. It's not like you have a prototype, right? Now, in planning, you may have something on a piece of paper, or you may have some experts who are willing to kind of vouch for you for what you're saying, right? So during planning phase, when it comes to ship design, what we do have is we start writing some interesting code. And that code models the behavior of the project. So let's say you're building a washing machine, right? I mean, just a different example. You're building the washing machine. Now in the washing machine, what you'll do is you just write the software that emulates a washing machine. And then you start throwing some uh, challenges to it. And these challenges are called test vectors. Like, does the washing machine uh, program, if I put permanent press and uh, hot and warm and high, high spin and, uh, and you know, sun and alarm, something like that, these conditions, right? So during the planning phase, you do have the luxury of actually writing code and then throwing some test vectors at that code, even if you do not have a prototype. Now, those of you who actually make hardware um, actually go through interesting stuff <laughs> in, in the development phase. And during the development phase, you know, before you get your prototype, there's a whole bunch of work that goes on in validation, which is based on spec. And, you know, I'll talk more to it with some examples uh, with you. And once the silicon comes, so meaning once your prototype comes, now you actually have a prototype and you can do more validation much faster. Why? Because before you have a prototype, you are modeling everything, right? And when you model everything, it depends on the machine that you're running your model on. And think about chips, like the ones Intel produces or some other companies do. These chips have millions of transistors. You know, the latest one I worked on before coming here had eight billion transistors. Imagine validating that in a model. Right? It takes, it would take months, years to do the validation. So you've got to be figuring out how I can be smart about validation during that phase. But guess what? The moment that prototype comes and you plug it in onto the motherboard, the same chip validation that took multiple person years to do validation on uh, using a model on a machine, the moment you plug that hardware, it literally takes two minutes to do the amount of validation that it took you multiple years to do. And, and it's just because the silicon works much faster. So once the prototype comes, of course, it's based on product reference data. So now I'll talk a little bit more about spec versus reference, and because that's a very important distinction. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, uh, you know, if you look at it again, the takeaway from here is as you are contemplating taking your idea in mind or on paper, validation starts from that particular date, right? And it continues and it evolves in form. 
and all the way to the point where you have a prototype. And now to the prototype, you can do a whole lot of hardware-based validation, where early you would only do a limited form. Right? So, um, so there is a few terms that you would hear people speak. Uh, sometimes you hear the term test. Sometimes you say validation, right? And sometimes you might hear someone say verification. So there's a subtle difference. Um, I'll only expand on that difference here on this slide. And then for the rest of them, we'll just call it validation. Because at the end of the day, I mean, if you understand the subtlety of these terms, then I think you'll be comfortable if I just call everything a validation. It'll be okay. So when we talk about hardware development, you know, testing is commonly referred to as validation. So when you say I'm testing a chip, you can also say I'm validating the chip. It's okay. Um, when you think about validation, the scope of validation actually changes from before you have a prototype and after you have a prototype. And any amount of validation that you're doing or any kind of validation you're doing before you have a prototype is actually called verification. And verification has a very subtle uh, but very important distinction is during verification, you're constantly asking the question, are we building the product right? Why is that? Because you actually do not have a car. You're just asking the question, am I building it right? And the reason you're asking that question is because you have a spec of the product, but not the product as a reference, right? And you're only referring to that spec as you are building, as you're designing that product. So during verification, you're saying, am I doing it right? And then the moment you get the design in the form of a hardware, your question changes. And you'll start asking the question, did we build the right product? So that's a subtle difference. Am I doing it right? Did I build the right thing? That's a difference, right? So if, you, if you're comfortable with this distinction, and, and if you will allow me to just use the term validation from here on out, the rest of the presentation, then I think you're okay. Otherwise, I'll have to be very careful about what I say when. Okay? But, but keep in mind, it's just the scope of what you're doing against the reference that you have, which allows you to use the term verification versus validation. Okay? So let's look at this, right? We'll, let's take a very simple example where we are validating a small chip. Every one of you, um, every one of you is familiar with an hand gate, right? Um, you know, two inputs, and you can look at an hand gate and you can say, if I were to draw a table, it'll look just like this. Two inputs, therefore four rows, and they are enumerated comprehensively. I got all four ways in which an end gate would work, and I can draw two tables. And then you say, okay, well, you know, I have to translate this thing into a design. So I'm sure many of you have actually played around with this thing we call HDL, hardware description line. It's the bread and butter of how we do chip design in all of these, uh, you know, these chip design companies, is we choose to represent uh, any uh, logic with a hardware description line. This one is just think of it as a fictitious, you know, toy hardware description language. And you can see here, you know, it says uh, chip and input A and B, output out parts. It's got an NAND gate. It's got a NOT gate. You know. Assuming you got an end or not, so it uh, makes an end gate and it specifies the connectivity, right? So we wrote the HDL. So now you have said, I'm going to build an end chip. I'm, I know what a truth table looks like. The complexity of this end is simple enough. I can enumerate all conditions. I found a way to actually show how the HDL, how I can express it in the form of HDL. Well, what I'll do now is write a test file. So if, again, you know, the fonts are really small here, but, but all I'm trying to do here is show you that there's these four sections, and these four sections uh, represent the four different conditions that you're testing. So you're giving 0, 0, you're giving 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1. Okay. So there's a couple of things to note here. First of all, when you're building very, very simple products, uh, those simple products lend themselves 
to almost exhaustive validation, right? as you've seen here. Very simple design. The second thing to take away from here is, imagine if I had not shown you this test file. I think you could still say, if there was a way that I could mathematically represent the truth changes, and if there was a way I could mathematically extract the equation out of the HDL, and then formally compare the two, I could actually verify uh, uh, right away that the two are equivalent. Right? You could do that. But in addition to that, I think, well, this chip is simple enough. It's got only four enumerations. So what I'll do is I'll just see the test vectors, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And just be done with it, right? It will take a few minutes, and I'll be done with it. And I can guarantee after this that my hand gate is going to work. So well, small chip, it's really easy. But um, oh, by the way, yes, so I do have a little format here, which is compare. So you know, stimulate this HDL using this test file and compare it against you know, this format and if the, the output matches, then you say, I'm OK. OK, everybody with me so far? Yeah, OK. Well, um, so you know, I think I already said that you can actually exhaustively validate small chip. Now, you know, when we look at the previous picture, and now you start thinking in terms of validation, there's a couple of themes that actually emerge. So remember the thing I, I talked, said that you get to look at the truth table and an HDL, and there was a mathematically mathematical way in which you could extract those things and compare mathematically, right? Then that would be like almost formal equivalence verification, right? You're saying one format, one the design expressed in format A is equivalent to design expressed in format B. So that's what we call as transformation. And you know, you have to ask yourself in the design that you are thinking about doing, would you want to do transformation method or would you want to validate it using a reference model method? In transformation method, all we're saying is we got a design represented in a format A and we got a design represented in format B. And all we're saying is we're going to transform it here and then we're going to verify the equivalence of these two. So a lot of verification that is done using that formal verification actually uses this transformation method. And it's very successful. And in fact, these days, you know, some of the very large chips actually lend themselves to a transformation verification method, which is completely exhaustive, guaranteed working. Assuming your reference was ideal, you can say that if my design matches the reference, I can guarantee it's going to work, right? So you can do that. Unfortunately, it does not work for every complexity because certain things are way more complex, right? So for that, we apply the second method. And the second method, and you all are very familiar with that, basically what it is, is just like we saw in the previous case, we have a design, we set the stimulus to that design, and then we have a reference, and you saw that table, right? The comparison table I showed, and all you do is just compare the output of the design under the stimulus. And, you know, line by line, you say, if it matches, I'm OK. So, so a lot of times, we end up doing the second one. And the reason for that is, if the design complexity is beyond the scope of something that we can formally verify, we choose a method like this. Okay. Any questions on this? And you, you saw a very, very simple illustration on the previous slide for both of these methods. So let's look at a little bigger example. And here you've got a toy ALU. Again, nowhere near the complexity of what ALU would be on your cell phone or on, on, your, on a machine like this or on your laptop. But it's just a toy ALU. And so I don't want you to be caught up in the details of this ALU, but basically you can do a bunch of operations. And these operations are, you know, this a few control functions right here. You can zero out a number, you can you can negate a number, you can add, you can do all sorts of functions. And you know, the specification is given right here saying if 
the control signal, this is active, then do this. If the control signal Y active, then do this, right? So that's how the ALU is described. And, uh, and the picture of the ALU looks something like that. It's got these two inputs. It's got these control inputs. And it's got these on the stage. All right. So, I mean, you know, we all at one point in our life have designed and started medical devices. Right? Fair to say? And engineering students, we have done that. So, so, you know, but the thing is, the moment you look at a design like this, it looks definitely way more complex than verifying the end gate, right? Because in end gate, we could conceive the truth table, we could immediately implement that truth table, we could throw all those four vectors in the truth table at the design and verify it, right? Or not really, right? Here, it takes a little more thinking. So, so when you think about it, you know, I'm not showing you a mile-long test file right here. I've just taken some extra. But you can say that if you had one, two, three, four, five, six, six control signals, it's capable of two to the power of six or 64 combinations, right? Controls. They could all take different permutations. And then if you have two 16-bit numbers, those 16-bit numbers could have just a gazillion uh, uh, possible scenarios of, uh, uh, by the way, you have to pardon me for using very colloquial terms here, right? So it doesn't mean something. Anyway. <laughs> but, but the idea is that you could think two 16-bit numbers, they could all be zeros, or they could all be one, 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 all ones, right? I mean, just, just amazing number of, of combinations. Now, as you think about that, can you conceive of verifying, validating each and every single case? No, right? We won't. So we have to be intelligent in how we go about picking these things. So, you know, I got a little bit of an extraction of a compare file, but, you know, the idea is that I can, I can tell you for sure that I feel very comfortable about this ALU when it was designed. Uh, and certainly the test file did not have 64 possible combinations of the controls. It did not have all those resilient combinations of the inputs. It had select combinations um, of the inputs. That's all it did. Okay, and it was enough to give me confidence. And you know, the point why, what allows us to have confidence that the quality is good enough, is the subject of the next few slides. Okay, but the idea is that as the chips get bigger and bigger, you start pruning the search space of validation. I'm not suggesting the verification validation stops. In fact, it intensifies. The more complex the chip, the more worried you are that something is going to fail. But you also realize that you have limited amount of time, and therefore, and limited resources, and therefore, you got to be very smart about how you pick the test cases. And this is one simple example to illustrate how you're going to be selected. Okay. So, uh, bigger chips need sampling of interesting conditions. Okay, so everybody with me so far on these two kind of contrasting examples. Okay, so so what it leads to is a conversation about about coverage, and this is the interesting part uh, that everybody who designs anything complex in terms of hardware uses all the time, right? So the way we explain coverage is uh, in the previous pictures you certainly saw. Uh, stimulus, right? We were generating stimulus, as in for N gate, those were the four stimulus for the ALU, the number of those cases. We also have response checking, so like a little comparison. That's the second vector. The third vector we introduced is called coverage. So I just build these things out quickly just to show you what coverage is. And what coverage is, it describes the scope and likely success of the verification problem. The key here is, and those of you who are going to build complex designs, you have to really at some point think about whether you do it in the terms I'm describing or whether you do it in a term that you can think of and feel more comfortable with. At some point, you will have to think about being selective in terms of how you will test your design so it meets the scope it meets the schedule, and it meets the hard limits of the resources you got available, right? I mean, then you're probably working in two-person teams. So you got to figure out at some point, think, 
I need to have this prototype done and demonstrated by this date. And then you leave some amount of time for testing. And then within that amount of time, you got to figure out how you use that time most intelligently. So you say to yourself, any possibility of embarrassment that you design is not worth it, right? So, so that's what coverage is. And I'm going to show you examples from CPU design where the chips are infinitely more complex uh, than what uh, we ask our students to, uh, to pick up uh, during a course life. So look at this picture right here. So, you know, we ask ourselves, first of all, well, you know, if, if, if you look at this picture, so there's certainly this big circle right here. And what this is saying is, I have a design, and the design is represented in its functionality by the circle. You know, that's the whole space of functionality of that design. And within that space, just like, you know, we live in the state of Texas, we go and every now and then, you know, we go and take a flag, put a flag and say, hey, I got a good feeling that there's going to be oil around here, right? And I'm, I'm not saying that based on experience. I just suspect that that's probably the case. Because otherwise, you know, you'd have fracking going on or search for oil going on in every square mile of, of our state. But it doesn't. You know, folks find interesting ways of figuring out where are the right places to go and explore. So they use certain, you can say intuition, you can say um, past experience, you can say some mathematics, you can say some experiment, all that stuff. But what it leads to is these little dots right here. So you find these dots and say, if I can cover these test conditions, these are the test conditions, then I have a very high degree of confidence that my design is going to work. So, when we talk about coverage, what we're talking about is A, how do we come up with these test conditions in the most intelligent way? And B, how do we make sure that we are hitting these test conditions with the least amount of effort, right? So those are two separate questions that you have to answer. And both of those questions ultimately result in a clear distinction between this taking years of time to validate versus the same thing taking literally months to validate. That's a big difference, right? One where you could be completely paranoid and exhaustively do the validation till you miss all the deadlines, the course has gone, you know, come and gone, and you're still not done, versus uh, where you're saying, I'm going to be smart about it, I'll figure out the test conditions that are critical for me to test this product. Those are the conditions that I'm now going to test with the least amount of effort, right? So what we are talking about is not writing a test for each and every one of these, but finding some intelligent way in which you can kill 100 birds with one stone, right? Meaning you can, you can cover multiple test conditions with one form of test. And that's the power of random testing that we employ in each of the designs. Now, I am very sure that for, for your projects, high likelihood. So I, I submit that there's a high likelihood that you might not be doing random validation for your products that you're building. But but short of that, I think it's important to recognize that, that there is certainly a merit in, first of all, that not be swayed by uh, exhaustive testing. And second, uh, uh, coming up with test conditions that are critical for your product, and then finding efficiency that you're covering many of those test conditions with as few tests as possible. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so here we have, you know, um, the same principle that I talked about. The idea here is that you got some tests, and the idea is that if you're hitting them in some random fashion, and this is how we do each of design, that you're very likely to find the bug that existed in this. So you hit um, the test conditions that are those solid dots, but while randomly exercising that space, you not only exercise those specific test conditions, but you also exercise the bug that were hiding somewhere in between. So when do you actually get coverage holes? And the time you get coverage holes is depending on how you design your 
your tests, if they happen to be not overlapping, that's where you find that, oh, I have this test generated here, and I have another one here. And yes, within their own space, they covered everything nice by the power of randomness, but they were not overlapping to the extent where they allowed something to be. Right? And that's called a coverage hole. So in chip design, you know, uh, when we're doing validation, very important to outline your test conditions. We call them coverage points. Very important to outline how you're going to actually uh, cover or, or test that, uh, those coverage conditions. And then finally, very important to ask yourself, where are the coverage holes? And then, you know, that is certainly not the end of the story. The last question that the managers all the keep pounding is saying, you have so many coverage holes, how are you going to actually plug those coverage holes? Because it's only when you plug those coverage holes that you feel confidently that the new design is going to actually work. Okay. So as we conclude you know, our conversation today, really the central question for us is how do we build quality in our products, right? So it's basically validating for quality. Um, understanding your design. Um, implementing design hierarchy, right? I mean, you know, you saw the simple case of an end gate, very easy, but then many of those end gates actually were put together, design an ALU. Some ALUs were designed or put together in the bigger scheme to design a CPU, right? So, I mean, it's a hierarchical design. So, when the problem looks complex, the best thing is to break it down and then independently cover the validation of each. And then as you sample them, then you start testing the interactions, right? So that's the second part. For each hierarchy level, it's very important to have a plan. And so, you know, when I talk about validation begins from day one, um, you came up with an idea, you have some representation of that idea. Very important to sit with some experts right off the bat and saying, hey, here's what I'm thinking of designing. Here's how I think the design is going to operate. And here's how I'll test it. What do you think? Right? So that's called a test plan. Write a test plan and review it with folks who are either experts or who can be the sounding board for you. Right? Third, um, exercise the test environment and then collect coverage. So, you know, for very simple designs, uh, like Endgame, you got four test cases, your coverage points are four, your coverage is 100%, everything is good. For a design like ALU, you intelligently figure out how you're going to test, and then you show that those conditions that you're testing are mature enough and exhaustive enough to actually test the whole the quality of the ALU without having to test each and every uh, input condition, right? So, so that's the third part. And then, as I say with a sense of humor, rinse and repeat the quality is achieved. I mean, that's what you do, it's just a lot of iteration as you're going through the validation design. So the question always keeps getting asked, is the validated this job ever done? And uh, the answer is unfortunately no. You know, unless, unless you have formal methods to exhaustively show that the design is complete, right, verify it. Uh, short of that, when you are feeding it test vectors, right, you're collecting coverage, it, you know, you might be able to achieve 99.9% but there's still some amount of work that needs to be done. So again, it all depends on the quality metrics and the ROI of the design, right? I mean, a lot of you are familiar with curves like this, right? Where, uh, you know, the return on investment keeps going up and up, and at some point it just saturates, right? And then you keep applying effort, and then the return is barely inching for, right? It's just almost that way. So you got to make a call at some point that pre-validation beyond that point is just going to be uh, fairly key time. So why was the Pentium bug not found? You know, this is an interesting thing, and I certainly don't speak as an authority here. It's just that some of it is anecdotal, some of it is from documents that came around after the postmortem. But, you know, folks said, well, you had a bug in the lookup table. Uh, you could have simulated everything. Uh, so, you know, certainly the people said, well, if you could simulate everything, it would have taken us uh, six years to do that uh, on, on, you know, machine that we don't have. And so clearly, you know, our time does not allow that, right? So 
So they said the best we could do is throw some random uh, vectors at it, but uh, unfortunately, the vectors we thought were covering everything, you know, uh, to get us the right test conditions were just not good enough. And so we missed certain combinations of the lookup table. Then, you know, folks said, well, even if you missed during design, you had a real, you know, you could have actually emulated that design on hardware. I mean, some of you probably are doing projects that might use an FPGA, right? Where you write HDL and you map it on a, on a, on a logic field. So that question was asked, but, uh, um, but, you know, they said, well, the emulators during that time were still working at very low frequency, 100 hertz. I mean, that's not fast enough. So, um, so uh, we couldn't do it to the extent that you would have liked. And then the question came, well, even if you did not do it before you take out a design, even if you did not do the testing on this lookup table with a real piece of silicon, um, well, you know, you could have just run, um, I mean, you could not do emulation, you could have just, you had a real piece of silicon, you had a year to debug it, you could have found this error then. And the answer is, well, uh, you know, we ran a bunch of tests, uh, but uh, we just probably did not run the right kind of tests. So, so, you know, this was a classic case for where, where you know, certain types of logic uh, just don't lend themselves uh, to any amount of guesswork. So, you know, if, if you ask me, uh, the floating point arithmetic was one area where Intel decided that we are not going to go through validation using test vectors only. We are actually going to formally verify exhaustively the arithmetic logic or the, in this case, the floating point. So we went through formal verification of this, and that's why we haven't had an escape uh, since then of the design. So please keep in mind, you know, uh, I guess the reason I came here today is just to urge you that as you're building your design, as proud as you are of getting a great idea and also coupling it with great performance, you are creating a great design, please do not forget that you have to test it. And please do not forget that your testing does not start after the prototype. The validation starts from the time you actually conceive of the idea. It's just the forms of the validation that change over time. Okay, thank you very much. What questions? I think this was my last one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Simon Stavros, did you have any comment like specific to the class that you wanted to highlight? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's fair to say it's yeah, yeah. those validations were very good work, so that was kind of good that we did great things. And we didn't pay our contribution, we didn't get any extra money, so we just came up with this one. Um, but some of the stuff that we ran through, uh, we talked about earlier, we really think it's good today. So we intended to be uh, verified everything we can tell you. We appreciate your time. I have a question for the class. We talked, uh, it was presented to you that there's a cost of changing the design and how that cost rises exponentially, right? In production example. What is the cost to you in 403, 404? No, not just time. What else is the cost? You can change the design. What's the cost? Great. Instead of millions of dollars, you can say percent of your course grade. So if you make changes now, it'll only affect your grade a little bit. If you make changes at the end of the semester, it may have a big impact on your grade, right? So everything that was said is exactly true on the micro scale, but I'm just trying to help you translate that. You just need to transform algorithm into sitting guest speaker at the class. That's my suggested call. What's the other big takeaway? Where's the key word? What did you get? I, I like to do this one. What'd you get? <laughs> Exhausted testing is three, four. So that's not a, that's not the smart way, right? So be smart. Don't try and there's no such thing as perfect. Let it go. Figure out what your requirements, what's good enough, and be smart and test that, right? No such thing as perfect, not in engineering. Not that I know. In quantum 
everything on the shelf is perfect, but not in the use. All right, what are your other takeaways? You're doing a summary. I'd like to see this on it. It's not best that it doesn't work. But takeaways. Validation versus verification. Catch that. Any other keywords? Quickly. Anything? A lot goes on before you ever start building something. Exactly right. Well, one thing you guys remember. You brought it up to everyone. Validation starts the day you start your design. You have your plan, your validation plan, and if you're in parallel having that validation team working with the development team. Those guys are working at the very beginning looking at how you're designing it because their goal, if you remember, as the people validator, their goal is to break the design. So if they're looking at how you're building it, they're figuring out ways in which they can break it because they're not better. So, if you have any questions, if you did this come up or not, I'm not in a hurry. So, I can answer questions. So, this is actually not what I was saying. Oh, make sure you sign in.